It would still be more than a year before the Declaration of Independence would be written and signed, but organized resistance and a series of open acts of defiance convinced King George to officially declare the American colonies to be in a state of rebellion. In April of 1775, the King ordered British armed forces stationed in Boston to march west to Lexington and Concord. Their mission? Capture the leaders of the Minutemen, John Hancock and Sam Adams, and confiscate a stockpile of weapons and gunpowder. As the Redcoats approached Lexington that April morning, about 70 Massachusetts militiamen, nicknamed Minutemen, gathered in their path. The British ordered the Minutemen to lay down their weapons and disperse. The stubborn rebels refused, and tensions grew. Suddenly, a shot was fired. Many years later, this single shot would be called The Shot Heard Round the World by the American author Ralph Waldo Emerson. That shot sparked the battle, with the Redcoats sending a volley of gunfire into the American ranks. With several Minutemen falling dead or wounded, the British pushed on. In Concord, a large number of Minutemen had collected. When the British marched in, the Minutemen hit them with a vicious attack. By the end of what many consider the first day of the Revolutionary War, more than 250 British regulars lay dead, while less than 100 of the Massachusetts militia were lost. A month later, one of the Second Continental Congress's first decisions was to build an official fighting force. The Continental Army was formed, and George Washington was the man chosen to lead it. The delegates also tried to resolve the growing crisis peacefully. In an official letter to the king, the colonists stated their intentions. We beg leave further to assure your majesty that our breasts retain too tender a regard for the kingdom from which we derive our origin to request such a reconciliation as might in any manner be inconsistent with her dignity or welfare. The apprehensions that now oppress our hearts with unspeakable grief being once removed, your majesty will find your faithful subjects on this continent ready and willing at all times to assert and maintain the rights and interests of your majesty and of our mother country. The Olive Branch Petition, 1775. In case the British intended to squash the rebellion, the Americans drafted a sharply contrasting second document. The arms we have been compelled by our enemies to assume we will, in defiance of every hazard, with unabating firmness and perseverance, employ for the preservation of our liberties, being with one mind resolved to die free men rather than to live slaves. The Declaration of Causes and Necessities of Taking Up Arms, 1775. While this declaration stopped short of calling for independence, it did declare the colonists were justified in fighting for their rights. The Olive Branch petition was delivered to King George immediately, but the king refused to look at it. His response was to send more troops to Boston. Seeing this, the growing Continental Army decided to seize some high ground near Boston, known as Breed's Hill. To remove the rebels, on June 17, 1775, 2,000 British troops were sent to the hill, which many people later reported incorrectly as Bunker Hill. Two attacks up Breed's Hill resulted in heavy losses for the British. But on the third attack, the Americans began to run out of gunpowder. As the superiorly armed British advanced, the Americans left Breed's Hill to what was left of the British force. That day, more than 1,000 redcoats died in the volleys of colonial musket balls, while nearly 400 Americans were lost. News of such American success gave inspiration to the ranks of the newly formed Continental Army. British generals, believing they could crush the American forces by cutting off the New England area from the rest of the colonies, planned a three-pronged attack. In the spring of 1777, a British force under General Burgoyne began moving down from Canada, while troops in New York under General Howe advanced up the Hudson River to meet them. A third force was also sent to join up from a western post. However, their plans didn't go as the generals had expected. Burgoyne's troops found the travel through Upper New York more difficult than expected. Bogged down in the woods north of Saratoga, New York, the British were sent reeling in two successive battles. With even more troops arriving, the reinforced Americans surrounded Burgoyne's force, and on October 17, 1777, at Saratoga, the embarrassed British general surrendered to General Gates of the Continental Army. His 5,000 redcoats were marched to Virginia as prisoners. It was an American victory that was sorely needed. 
Although General Howe had decided to abandon his plan to link up with Burgoyne, his army had fared much better. He had marched south instead and attacked Philadelphia. In September of 1777, Howe's army manhandled Washington's forces and in two battles captured the rebels' capital city. As winter set in, Howe and his troops enjoyed the comfort of Philadelphia's amenities. Meanwhile, Washington and his troops retreated to Valley Forge, where the difficult winter took almost as big of a toll as the Redcoat musket balls. With Washington suffering the defeats near Philadelphia, the news of Gates and Arnold's great success revived the faltering colonial cause. Most importantly, the victory at Saratoga convinced the leaders of France to come forth with much needed foreign aid and fighting troops.